Hello and welcome to this session of MD310 Medical Care Provider, Topographic Anatomy and Medical Terminology. By the end of this session, you'll be able to correctly identify surface structures on the human body, describe what are called planes, direction, and structural relationships of the human body, and correctly identify and combine common medical prefixes, root words, and suffixes, as well as define commonly used medical terms. Let's start with a basic case. You have a patient who suffered a laceration to their leg. How do you describe this laceration to medical control? On the left of the screen is the patient's upper thigh and hip. On the right is their knee. You would describe this laceration as follows. Medical control, I have a patient who has a laceration to their anterior thigh. It is the distal part of the thigh, approximately five centimeters proximal to the knee. It's in the cross-sectional axis, a horizontal laceration, approximately three centimeters in length. Why do you need to know superficial anatomy? You need to be able to perform accurate patient assessments. And by knowing what lies where, you can locate organs and systems underlying the skin. You'll be able to effectively communicate your findings with other providers and through this, provide quality patient care. These images, available in the public domain through Wikipedia, describe the superficial anatomy of the human body, male and female. Generally, the body is divided into the head, the chest, the abdomen, including the pelvis, and the extremities, upper and lower. The body has an anterior surface, posterior surface. You can also view the body laterally, that is, from the sides. Looking at these images, you can see the labeling describes these major areas. The trunk, or thoracoabdominal region, describes the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. It's important to recognize that this particular area does not have distinct superficial marketing markings to distinguish the underlying organs. That is, when you breathe, the diaphragm, the large muscle that separates the chest from the abdomen, moves. At the end of expiration, the top of the diaphragm can be almost to the nipple line. At the end of deep inspiration, it can be almost to the umbilicus or belly button. And so, while superficial anatomy is important to know, there are some limitations. This is an image of what's called the anatomical position. And this is the basis for all description. When we use terms like anterior and posterior, we're describing the individual in this position. Probably the most important thing to remember is to look at the hands. This patient's hands are oriented with the palms forward. And that's very important. In the anatomical position, the palms are forward because you can rotate them with the thumbs pointed in and it would appear that the back of the hand is forward. But just like starboard and port, this is a standard description. So the anatomical position has the hands forward. The body is divided into three major planes. The coronal plane coronal coming from the term, the term for heart, divides the body from front to back. The sagittal plane divides the body side to side. And the transverse or cross-sectional plane cuts through the body in slices from top to bottom. And these are used as anatomic reference points. We often describe findings based on relationships of one part of the body to another. And so these lines describe different relationships or parts of the body. The red line is pointing laterally from the patient's midline. The brown line points laterally away from the midline and medially towards the midline. This is how you would describe structures related to each other. The red line also indicates the patient's left, 
Well, the green line indicates the patient's right. And when we discuss direction, it's always in terms of the patient. The blue double-headed arrow along the patient's arm describes proximal, that is, closer to the core of the body, and distal, that is, further away from the core of the body. So the hand is distal to the elbow, and the elbow is proximal to the hand. The body is also divided into a superior and inferior division. So the feet are inferior to the knees, and the hips are superior to the knees. The chin is superior to the feet. Two other lines are also drawn on this patient. The blue line over the patient's left clavicle is the mid-clavicular line. And this line is used to describe a point roughly halfway between the patient's sternum and breastbone and the brown line, which is called the anterior axillary line, or the line at the front of the armpit. We also describe directional terms when looking at the body from the side. You again see the anterior axillary line, that is, the line that runs along the front of the armpit. There's also a posterior axillary line. And splitting those two in half is the mid-axillary line, an imaginary line that runs right down the middle of the armpit. Now, if you look at the brown double-headed arrow, that describes the two directions, anatomic relations, that you would experience looking at a patient from their side. That is, anterior, the front, and posterior, the back. The blue double-headed arrow, again, describes superior and inferior. Now, the hand presents a tricky problem because it can be rotated in all directions. And again, we could use the anatomic position with the arms hanging by the side and the palms facing forward to describe the palm as being anterior to the back of the hand and the back of the hand being posterior to the palm. However, we prefer to use the terms palmer to describe things on the palm side of the hand, and that can also be used to describe the forearm, and dorsal to describe things on the back of the hand, and that can also be used to describe the forearm as well. And again, proximal and distal are terms that are commonly used in describing the hand. Now, patients will not always present standing up. They may be lying on a supporting structure. And so we use the terms supine and prone. When someone is supine, they're laying flat on their back with the face pointing forward. When they're prone, they're lying face down. The only easy way to remember this is that when they're prone, the posterior, or their back, is highest in the air. People can also, of course, be laying on their side. And so we see here what is called the recovery or left lateral recumbent position. Left because the patient is lying on their left side. Lateral because they are lying on their side. Recumbent because they're laying flat and positioned to describe what we're describing. We also use the terms flexion and extension to describe movement. In flexion, you close the angle of a joint. So when you flex your elbow, you bring your palm closer to your shoulder. In extension, you extend over the joint. And so when you extend your elbow, you move your palm away from your shoulder and bring your arm into a straight line. We additionally use the movement terms AB, or abduction, and AD, or adduction. And they're actually pronounced that way. Abduction and adduction, because abduction and adduction, spoken quickly, can be confused with each other. In abduction, you are moving a structure away from the midline. So if you start with your arm hanging down from your shoulder and your palm against your thigh, and you rotate your shoulder out 90 degrees so that your arm is sticking straight out from your side, you have abducted your arm. If you bring your arm from that 90 degree position back to your side with your palm pressing on your thigh, you have adducted your arm. And you can think of this in terms of in adduction, you are adding your body parts to your core 
and in abduction you're not. You're moving them away. Now many medical words are made by combining prefixes, suffixes, and root words. And the following is a list of commonly used prefixes. So a or an is without. Someone who is apneic is without breathing. Hypo means under or beneath. So a hypodermic shot goes under the skin. Hyper means above. So hypertension means high blood pressure. Dis means bad, difficult, or painful. So dysesthesia would be painful sensations. Epi means above or outside. So the epidermis is the upper layer of the skin. Sub means below or inside. So subcutaneous means below the skin. Pre means before. Ante also means before or preceding. So an antecedent event is something that happened before the important event. Brad or Brady means slow, so someone with bradycardia has a slow heart rate. Tack or tacky means fast, so someone with tachycardia has a fast heart rate. Mal means bad or wrong, so something malodorous smells badly. Peri is around or in the area of, so a perianal abscess would be an abscess in the area of the anus. Inter is between two areas or objects, so Intertriginal candidiasis is a fungal skin infection between two skin folds. Intra is within one area or one object. So an intracranial hemorrhage would be a bleeding stroke inside the brain. We also use suffixes to modify medical words to describe what we're talking about. So itis is inflammation or irritation of something. So appendicitis is inflammation of the appendix. Osis is a condition, status, or process of something, and it may denote abnormal increase, although not necessarily. So hyperhidrosis is excessive sweating. Ea is a condition, particularly if abnormal. So anemia, low blood counts. Ick or ickle is characteristic of or relating to. So a diabetic is someone with diabetes. Alga is related to a pain sensation. So someone with an antalgic gait means that they're walking oddly because they have pain on the affected side. O or U is a small or little example of the named root word. So a venule is a small vein. Path or pathy is a disease or disorder of, and pathophysiology is the study of abnormal function. Raj or Rhea is particularly uh, excessive or abnormal flow, although it can be used to describe any flow, so hemorrhage is excessive bleeding. We combine our prefixes and suffixes with root words, and we've been doing this already. So cardio is heart, pnea is breathing or lung, and it's not really pronounced pnea, you would say apnea uh, to describe someone who's not breathing. Hepato relates to the liver, arthro relates to a joint, Gastro relates to the stomach, so gastritis would be inflammation of the stomach. Pneumo can also relate to the air or lung, so pneumonia is an infection of a lung. Cephalod is the head. Bronco relates to one of the structures in the lung called a bronchus, so a bronchogram is a picture taken of a bronchus. Gluco is related to sugar, so a glucometer is a device that measures blood sugar. Heme relates to blood. Febrile is fever or abnormally high body temperature. It can be a standalone word, or you can put other prefixes and suffixes on it, such as afebrile, without a fever. Derm is related to skin. Costal is related to ribs. Ortho or osteo is related to bone. Rhino is related to the nose, so combine that with itis, and you have rhinitis, which is inflammation of the known. And ox, in its combined formed can indicates oxygen. Two other important root words include arterio and ven, or vein. Arterio are blood vessels that carry blood flow away from the heart and towards capillaries. It doesn't relate to how much oxygen is in the blood, but just the direction that they're carrying the blood. So anything moving away from the heart towards a capillary bed is described by arterio, so artery, arteriole. A vein 
or ven is any blood vessel that carries flow from a capillary bed towards the heart. Again, whether there's oxygen in or not doesn't matter. So we've got veins and venules. There are a number of important medical terms that you'll need to know both for this course and for taking care of patients. A sign is an observable fact. It's an objective finding that you can somehow sense with either your senses or a device. It is not subjective. A symptom is a patient's experience of a phenomenon. You can't see or measure a symptom. It's what a patient describes to you. Something that is acute, has a rapid onset, so I fall and I hit my knee, it starts to hurt. That pain is acute. Subacute is something that started recently, but not immediately preceding the event. If I fell and hit my chest a week ago and it's still hurting now, I have subacute chest pain. Chronic is something long standing. So if I injured my back two years ago and it still hurts, I have chronic back pain. Someone who is cyanotic, cyano is the base of that describing something blue, and particularly we talk about cyanosis, somebody with blue lips, blue fingers, not enough oxygen in their bloodstream, and someone who's diaphoretic is sweaty. Putting together all of the information that you gather and your plans for managing patients, they're done through use of a number of other medical terms. Subjective information is information told to you by a patient, bystanders, or some other medical provider that you cannot confirm yourself through any objective way. So symptoms would be subjective information. Objective is information is information that you can obtain through observation, examination, or other testing. Signs are objective information. Assessment is your impression, or what we call a working diagnosis, what you think is going on when you think about a patient's condition. Once you think you have a working diagnosis regarding a patient's condition, you need to have a plan, what you're going to do, or what you did to take care of that patient. Can we put all that information together? We certainly can, and we put it together in what's called a SOAP note, which is a universally recognized format for a medical note. It combines your subjective information, your objective information, your assessment of the patient, and your plan into an organized tool that lets you easily transmit to other people what you've done or what you intend to do. We'll now go through a brief knowledge review to make sure this material makes sense to you.